right, after some technical difficulties, we're thankful that you're uh, gonna join back in uh, to this pre-recorded message. Uh, we welcome you to this uh, Glacier View Seventh-day Adventist Church worship service for January 2nd. And I'd like to uh, begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for this Sabbath day. Thank you for the rest that you have extended to us, uh, both a physical rest, but Lord, also a spiritual rest found in you. Lord, we want to draw close to you uh, here today as we worship together in both a study of your word. Uh, send your spirit to be with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to start singing off with kids' song, I've Got the Joy, Joy, Joy Down in My Heart.
verses 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Our final song this morning is Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. And stand, yeah. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Have you all started your New Year's uh, resolutions yet, or do you just say, well, we'll just see how 2021 goes? We're starting. You started already. Resolution. Yeah. Yeah. Guideline. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's pray together one more time before we uh, jump into our study today. Father, we're so thankful for your love for us and the promises that you've given each one of us who would put our faith and trust in you. That, Lord, no matter what uh, struggles or challenges that we may go through, and thinking about the world that we live in right now, there are a multitude of them. Uh, that, Lord, when we put our trust in you, we know that you will safely carry us through. Um, we may go through the midst of things that seem like fire and floods and all the rest, but, Lord, we know that um, our life is always secure in your hands. Uh, we look forward, Lord, to how we will see you work uh, powerfully in the future uh, and, and powerfully even right now in our own lives. May we trust you, Lord, with our entire heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I want to start off with a word today that many of you have heard before. Uh, you may have discovered it or learned about this word going back through maybe history in high school or literature, your, maybe a literature class. Or you may have picked up on it in, I don't know, entertainment, a movie or radio or t a television show. But the word is utopia. You heard that word before? Yes. Utopia? 
Maybe some of the young ones, the young ones, have you heard of the word utopia? Yeah. What does it mean to you when I say utopia? It means like the perfect society. A perfect society. Okay, that's a good, yeah. That, that uh, uh, about sums it up uh, pretty well. Well, that word, um, you know, hasn't been around forever. Uh, it was coined in the 1500s by a writer, a thinker named Sir Thomas More. And when he, when he coined this term, he referred, it was a fictional island that he was referring to, that he had made up uh, in the uh, Atlantic Ocean off the coast of South America. And it was like an idealized society with, uh, uh, you know, everything was pretty close to perfect. And that's why we still use that term uh, today, to say a utopia or a utopic idea refers to an idealized society where people are near perfect. Now, throughout history, people have tried to actually put this into practice, to, to create a utopia. One of the most famous examples actually happened in the United States. Under a, a, he was a Welsh industrialist named Robert Owen. He traveled from uh, the UK, bought a town, so he was wealthy enough to buy a town in the early 1800s. Uh, in Har you know, this is not, uh, I'm not joking here. The town he bought was Harmony, Indiana, but he renamed it New Harmony. And he went about creating what was then, what we would consider, because it was, a socialist community where no one owned anything, they, everything was shared. And the, the community only lasted two years. It wasn't long before divisions broke out between the workers, who were putting in their labor to produce things, and the people that decided that they didn't need to work because they could have fair share of everything. And so it kind of fell apart and he ended up moving back to uh, to England. But other examples of these kind of utopic ideas or ideologies, you would maybe refer to the Bolshevik Revolution in early 1900s in Russia, where there was a communist revolution that took place. Most of you know about it from history. And uh, Russia eventually uh, was incorporated into this wider uh, Soviet uh, republic there. But what came out of that was a lot of famine and poverty along the way, which started as a utopia idea that no one would go hungry, uh, everyone would be treated fairly. Uh, it just devolved into a lot of problems. The Maoist revolution in China is another example of the idea of a creating a utopic society. And even there are modern day movements. For example, one that we've heard of in the last uh, year was, is called the defund the police movement. And the idea there is that, well, if you just got rid of police, people would act, you know, charitably toward one another, laws would be kept. But what we've seen, in fact, across most of the large cities in the United States has been almost a doubling in many areas of the homicide rate. So we see a lot of problems that come about when people try to enact uh, a utopia or have a utopia ideology in place. Now, all of these uh, movements are built on the same premise that life would be much better if just their idea of justice and social progress uh, could be enacted. But most often the failure happens because the proponents and the people that put these plans in place, they simply don't understand human nature and its relationship with power. Well, that still leaves us with a question. Maybe you have a question here today of, would, can this world ever get better as a, as a society? I mean, some people actually think that. I don't know where you are in this. Maybe you're watching at home and you're wondering, you know, you know what, is there anything better? What should I be... Uh, you know, waiting for. Some people have some ideas. Some people are already experiencing uh, a different kind of life uh, because they have met someone and they have embraced uh, something. Well, here's a question I want us to think about this morning as we, we ponder this. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for on a daily basis? Now, we as people, we, we do a lot of waiting, don't we? And think about when you wake up in the morning or you go about your day, is there anything that you wait for? Uh, you might be waiting for a bill to show up in the mail, or you might be waiting for a, a check to come in that's income, like your paycheck. You ever wait for things like that? Uh, you might be waiting for the latest, uh, I don't know, a movie to come out or a television show to come out. There's in fact a Christian television show that I'm, I'm waiting for the second season to come out, so I'm waiting for something there. And, uh, but people wait for all sorts of things, don't they? Some people are in fact waiting for a utopia to come into existence, like a man-made utopia. Well, how, are they off the mark with that? 
Are you waiting for something better to happen? I am. Uh, Nothing earthly. What's that? Nothing earthly. Nothing earthly. Well, I'm going to challenge you with that today, that there might be something, even here on earth, that you can wait for that's actually already available, that you can make a choice over. What about, uh, if you think about what, what we wait for, some of that is determined by things like, different variables like our age. Okay, so if you're maybe younger, that will, that will maybe have you waiting for something that would be different than say someone that's in their 70s or 80s. Uh, your physical health may determine what's first and foremost in your mind that you're waiting for. So just take a minute to think about this, uh, what you are waiting for. And in fact, those that are at home watching this, you might turn to the person next to you and say, what are you waiting for? You might tell them, I'm waiting for this. Maybe you're waiting for a new relationship or a friendship to happen. So what does your answer look like if you think about what you are waiting for? Is it mainly along the lines of material goods or for an event to occur? or some sort of change to take place in your life? Does it have to do with politics, or power, or money, or people? And once again, your answer may depend in large part on those different factors like age, health, relationship status, and financial situation. Given that we presently live in a COVID-dominated world, don't we? People in like small business, or who have been out of work for some time, may be saying, you know, I'm waiting for a COVID relief check. Still others might be saying, I'm waiting for January 6th to come around. Anybody know what happens on January 6th here in just a few days? That's when they count the electoral votes. And as many of you know from the news, there's been a, a lot of back and forth over how they're going to count those votes uh, from this last election that's happened. What about other people might say, I'm waiting for a vaccine to come out for COVID. Or I'm waiting for this illness to simply be done with so I can get my life back on track. I mean, I'm, maybe I'm waiting, I'm waiting for that, too. <laughs> others might be saying, I'm waiting for warmer weather. Or <laughs> others might say, I'm waiting for more snow. Or you're waiting for lower interest rates, or you're waiting for better interest, uh, leadership. It spans the whole spectrum of what people are waiting for. However, many of these things are outside of our control, aren't they? You can't change the weather. You can't make the social fallout from COVID go away. You can't speed up the vaccine rollout. Uh, you can't even make your own representatives in Washington or any other legislative body behave the way you want them to behave. And you can't make people treat each other better. And believe it or not, you can't make people be your friends. But there is one thing that you absolutely do have control over. It's something that you both wait for, but also that you don't have to wait for all at once. You'll see this in a moment. The amazing part of this is this thing is far more consequential, and it's more meaningful. It's more powerful. It's more hope-filled, more lasting, more satisfying, and more present, more realistic than even the grandest utopia that has been ever been devised by mankind. It answers all at once your longing for friendship, for security, for comfort, for peace, oh, for courage, for good leadership, and for good governance, it answers your questions about the future. And even in some cases, maybe not literally, but figuratively, it may even lead to better weather. Now maybe the gears are turning in your head right now. Maybe if you had just happened to stumble on our YouTube channel here, you were wondering, well, what is this thing? Some of you are already experiencing this, by the way. Some of you already know what the answer is to what you have been waiting for. And I hope today that if you don't know what it is that you are waiting for, or what you should be waiting for, that we can discover this together. And for others, the ones that, hey, I think I've, I'm on to this idea of what I should be waiting for, uh, you might leave our time here together with a fuller, more satisfying answer than you previously thought. So today I want us to look at some ancient texts. Because believe it or not, the ancient people didn't have, even though they didn't have the same technologies, they didn't have Facebook, of course, didn't have felt cell phones. They all grappled with the same questions that we're struggling with today as a nation or as a planet of people who are navigating anxieties and stresses on a daily basis. They struggled with the same things that we do, and they asked many of the same questions. And one of those people who pondered life's greatest questions was an, a king of ancient Israel. 
the most, you would say the most famous king and the most beloved king of Israel. His name was King David. And King David wrote some beautiful poetry and songs, and we call them psalms, don't we? And one psalm, number, uh, psalm number 27, which is what we'll start off reading today, This is a psalm in which David asks some of those big questions about life, about what to do when you face life's greatest challenges, those struggles, uh, when you might feel set in on all sides, like, boy, you're really struggling and you just feel closed in, you don't know where to go. Where would you turn to, David might ask? Where could you find help? Do you just give up? Do you just try to hide from this? And at the end of that psalm, he says something about where that answer is found and what you should do for it. In Psalm 27, verse 14, King David writes this, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Well, right there, if you were to ask the question, what are you waiting for? David might respond and say, well, I'm waiting on the Lord. What are you waiting for? And you could say, well, maybe I should wait on the Lord also. Now, what's interesting about this text right here, David gives us a possible answer to this question. What are you waiting for? He would say, wait on the Lord. And by the way, someone who has never waited on the Lord before, maybe they don't know who the Lord is and they're interested. They might be asking the question, well, I, I don't know what exactly that means to wait on the Lord. Am I... You know, if you were a first person to, or someone to look at this text for the first time, you might ask, um, well, what does it mean to wait on the Lord? If I wait on the Lord, does he show up, like, visibly? Is that what I should expect? Or maybe he'll talk to me audibly. Or maybe he'll send an angel to visit me, and that's how you wait on the Lord. Or waiting, I'm waiting for a long time, or waiting for a short time. Well, David doesn't actually say how long you're to wait on the Lord, does he? If you were to wait on the Lord for a really long time, what might you be looking for out in the future? You know, some people, I can tell you this, I'm, I'm waiting based on a promise from, that Jesus himself gave. I'm waiting for Jesus to come back. That's one way that we wait on the Lord. But that's a really long time in the future, isn't it? But it's something I'm very, well, we don't, from David's perspective, that maybe it would have been a long time in the future. So we don't know exactly how long uh, that would be. But if you, you could also wait for a very short amount of time for something. I want to uh, bring up a, a text in John chapter 14, uh, verse 3. And this is a very well-known text. Many of you know it by, by heart. Jesus says this. It's a great promise. He says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So what is the promise there? Jesus says, I'm going to come back and get you. So when you wait on the Lord, like when we're waiting on the Lord right now as a believer, that is something that's always in my mind, that Jesus is going to come back one day and take us to be where he is. And by the way, that's the, that's the primary driver for us in this promise. You know, there's a lot of things that I'm looking forward to in heaven and on the new earth one day. I'm looking forward to, like, we'll never have to worry about something like COVID again. Uh, we don't have to worry about elections anymore, thankfully. I mean, there's so many things that, that God, like, it's just going to be, a, I don't even know if it'll be a memory, but it will be gone. It will be, God will complete everything and he'll bring to fulfillment everything. I'm looking forward to meeting, seeing my grandparents and meeting, like, my ancestors and meeting the disciples, like, followers of Jesus from a long time ago. Aren't you looking forward to that? And many of you out there are looking forward to a time, maybe you, uh, you had a spouse or a child that passed away and you were looking uh, longingly at that point in time where you can see them again. And as wonderful as all those things are, they are, they are on the periphery of what is really at the core of why we're looking forward to Jesus coming back, and that is that we will be with him presently, physically, forever, and all this stuff will be in addition to that, okay, there is the idea of waiting on God in the present and, and in the very near future for things to happen. So if you are encountering a, a, a challenge or a question in your life, it might be, 
with how to relate to a child that you're raising up and you're struggling with how do I, how do I uh, you know, train this child up and guide this child. You, you would pray to God. The answer would be David would say, I want you to wait on the Lord. Right? That means, okay, I'm going to wait for him to guide and direct me in how I should relate to this. And that might, might be a very, uh, a very close answer in time. Like you might get it the next day. You might get it an hour later when you open up his word. You might, uh, your spouse may be inspired and say, oh, I, this thought just came to my mind that this is how I should, we should do this. And see how God has answered that right there. But there's something else that's even more present in that text. Because David says, he not only says, wait on the Lord, but then he says, be of good courage. Well, be of good courage is a present thing. Okay, waiting, even though if it's a short distance away, is, is still future, but be of good courage is a present thing. Now, courage is an interesting thing, isn't it? Um, this might lead us to the question of, well, how do I get that courage? Does that just come, you know, I just have to will that into being? Like, do I just have to will myself to be courageous? Well, looking around at the people, you know, how we navigate the world, I would say that maybe it's not entirely part of the human nature to be naturally, you know, courageous. Especially when it comes to standing on principle or standing for, for God. That strength has to, I think, I believe, has to come from somewhere else. Let's assume you read this Psalm 27 text and you, would, you, you asked the question, I would like to have courage, but I don't know where I would get it. Say you're looking at that for the first time. You're, you're new, you're a searcher, you're a seeker. And you read this text, or someone told you this text, or as I'm telling you on YouTube right now, and say, wait on the Lord and be of good courage. And you're saying, well, I, I'm not, I, I'm timid, or I'm fearful. How do I, how do I get that? Because it's offered in the present here. Okay, so we might look in other parts of the Bible. So Eric has said, ask and it will be given to you. So that would lead us to say, okay, I need to maybe look in another part of the Bible. I want to I wanna give a, a statement from God himself that he gave through the prophet Isaiah about navigating a world when you're beset on all sides by challenges and struggles. Okay. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah 43. And we're just going to look at the first couple of verses here. This is, by the way... Uh, they use this text in this, in this uh, television show, The Chosen, that's uh, quite an interesting show. And it's quite prominent here. Uh, Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. That means, by the way, to purchase someone back. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. And then in the first part of verse 3, it says, For I am the Lord your God. Now, there's, a, there's an incredibly powerful statement made by God there. When he purchases you, and as a believer, we believe that he did that through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's how he purchases. He, pe he, he, he claims people back uh, through the payment of the penalty that we were supposed to pay for sin. And he, he pulls us back out of bondage that might have been bondage to sin. Uh, uh, subs I mean, all sorts of things. Hub substance, mental issues. But God can redeem you from that. And then it, what it says here, it says, I have called you by your name. Jesus, God knows exactly who you are. He knows what you've been through. He knows everything about you. And this is how much he cares about you. And then he says, you are mine. So he purchases you, but doesn't say, well, I purchased you, you go on your way, own way. He says, I purchased you so that you can belong to me now. And that means that he's going to watch over you. And he's going to protect you. And he's going to guard you. And he's going to lead you to everywhere that you need to go. Even sometimes when it leads through things that are figurative fires, floods in your life, things like COVID, things like what happens when your, your business 
is destroyed because of something like a lockdown. It could be a health issue, but God says, I will be with you through that. It, it's, it could be a trying time, but I will carry you safely through. What an incredibly powerful reality, isn't that? That God says that you do not have to fear. Just like going back to David, saying, be of good courage. You don't have to fear because God has purchased you and he's claimed you as his. Now you think about that. When someone, has, when someone would do something like that, and maybe think to your time as a parent, um, or better yet, if you're a child and you're playing around outside and uh, you see a danger nearby, what would be your instinct? What would be the first thing you'd want to do? Yeah, you run to your parents, huh? Check them out. Oh, yeah. Why do you run to your parents? <coughs> because you trust them, because they care for you, because they, they've proven themselves to be the ones that watch over you and love you, don't they? That's your first protection. That's your first protection. You don't even have to talk about parents. You could just look into, like, we have grizzly bears around here, don't we? And we have, if you're in Africa, you might have lions. And if you're in Asia, you might have tigers. And any of those animals, when the, when the little cub uh, lion or the cub grizzly bear is out being curious and looking around the woods, and all of a sudden, they sense a wolf closing in, what do you think that cub does? It's going to run to mama. And you know what the mama bear does when she smells that, that wolf coming around? Oh, she gets all, <laughs> you would say she gets all up in that wolf's business, doesn't she? It's not good. <laughs> Even in a more important way, God those that he has purchased because they're his children now. He's claimed them as his own. And so when there is danger out there, you think uh, as the world goes through COVID and it goes through instability in, in political processes and even in the economic system, do you think God does not have his eye on his children? And is ready to watch over them as they go through that. And he'll be there for them. Most importantly, you have comfort and peace, as we were singing about earlier. One of the, uh, I'm going to give you a, a real quick practical example of what this looks like, just like with this last year that we've been through. And unfortunately, since we're recording on my phone right now, I don't have the PowerPoint. But it came from a Gallup poll that was just released this week. And Gallup, as you know, they, they survey all sorts of things. And Gallup this week, this week released their survey of mental health, mental and emotional health in the United States uh, from 2001 through the end of 2020. And so you'll look at this graph and you'll see starting in 2001, it bounces around with pretty, pretty stable mental and emotional health. And you go all the way through 20 years and then at the very end in 2020, you know what happens with mental and emotional health? Plummets. Well, I mean, plummets. yeah, it plummets, right? Whether it's, uh, you know, you had a category of excellent people that say they're excellent and people that were just uh, good, good to excellent before. And both of them just plummeted at the end. Big drop off. And then Gallup like to get more, they like to drill down with the people that respond to their surveys. And so they broke it down by all sorts of demographics. So male or female, age, age related groups, political affiliations, uh, income, education level. Okay. And they want to see, well, who, who suffered the most? And you look at all of them, and everything is just plunging in all categories. Some worse than others. But out of, I, I guess probably from that list, there was maybe about 20 different categories. And every single one of them, except for one, plummeted. You know which one was the category of people? They did well emotionally and mentally during this crisis, during this year. It wasn't, you know, you think about it, it's not just COVID. There was all sorts of things that happened. It was people who attended church services weekly. So they are regular churchgoers. Because what that tells me is people who have a healthy relationship with their fellow believers and they like to worship God each and every week. Theirs was the only group that went up. It increased in the level of mental and emotional health. If I was a curious person, an unbeliever out there, who was, who was curious about data, and I looked at that list, 
And if I was, you know, you're a thinking person, you like to ask questions, you're curious. You would want to say, what is it about that group out of every other group where during this such a trying time, they actually got stronger? Mentally, emotionally, <coughs> they were stronger. Well, those of us who are believers know why. It's because they have God. They, they have waited upon the Lord and they have, they have accepted and they've, they've put their trust in Him. And so when you reach a trying time, you know, this is the amazing thing about God, is when you reach a trying time or if there's a crisis that happens, if your trust is in God, it in fact increases your faith. It strengthens you. God likes to do that sometimes. Like, it's like with, with gold. You'll find this analogy in the Bible. Is if you want a stronger, more pure gold, you put it through a what? A fire. To, you, bur you burn off that, those impurities and the things that would weaken it. And so this is what God does with his people. Like he carries you through and you come out on the other side stronger because you trusted in him. So when David says, wait upon the Lord, at the heart of that call is to give your heart to God right now, and you will then be his. You will belong to him. You will be watched over by him. You will be shepherded by God. You will walk along this path of life, and no matter what stage of it you are in, you will walk through it a completely different person. The question for us today is, what are you waiting for? Are you waiting for, well, I'm going to wait for the apocalypse to come about? No, there, God wants something better for you right now. Yes, we wait for Jesus to come back. But here's a, a very good truth that you need to understand. His kingdom has already begun. He has already called people, and they have given him their hearts, and they are his children. And they are living a powerful and changed life. There was a point in time, in the time of Christ, when religious leaders came to Jesus and they asked him when the kingdom of God would come. And Jesus had a very interesting answer for them. In Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, it's recorded this. Now when he, Jesus, was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observations, nor will, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. It's in your midst. What were the people of Jesus' day waiting for? They were, in fact, many of them were waiting for the coming of the Messiah, a deliverer who would bring about God's kingdom. That would be like their version of a utopia, wouldn't it? Well, Jesus tells them in this text that God's kingdom, with its blessing and living without fear of your enemies, because, by the way, that's what they were looking for. They wanted a king who would vanquish the enemies, that would bring in this time of abundance and prosperity, and there would be no more strife. But this is what's part of God's kingdom that is already at work among his believers. That you live without fear of your enemies, and you have a godly king who is loving and caring, and there is an abundance. It just sometimes looks different. It's already here in the midst of you. That's because God's kingdom isn't just something to observe, like only a literal place. You notice how God didn't, Jesus didn't say, well, you're looking for, his, for God's kingdom? It's not going to be here. It's going to be in heaven one day, which is partly true. God's kingdom will is partly in heaven. It will be fully consummated in, his, in, in heaven. But before that, his kingdom is already at work in this world. It's kind of a mystery about his kingdom. But it's already started and it's being fulfilled right here on earth. So what are you waiting for? Jesus is ready to give you a heart of courage right now. Jesus is ready to give you an abundant life. He's ready to conquer the challenges that you are already encountering. And he's ready to move your relationship with others, with, with your colleagues and with your children and with your spouse and with your friends to a different and better level. Jesus is ready to work powerfully through your life to bring hope to others who don't know about his kingdom. So what are you waiting for? Give your heart to Jesus now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful uh, 
uh, for your promises. We're thankful that you have redeemed us and you have claimed us as your own. That we belong to you. And that you watch over us and you protect us. Lord, as we survey the last year that we've been through, and I don't know in history how it stacks up, but there's been times in the past where we're probably a lot worse. But these were trying times as well, and we don't know what it will look like going forward. I believe, Lord, now is the day where we turn to you and we say, I want to live fully already for you. I want a heart of courage. I want blessings in my life that I can experience and then share with others. I want to know what it feels like, Lord, to live a life of forgiveness and a life of love and a life of redemption. We're thankful to be called your children, Lord. Watch over us. Watch over our church family, our community of faith here. And help us, Lord, as we go out to share the truth about you. The Lord, we would be filled with your love and your light. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We thank you for being with us here today. God bless you on this Sabbath, and we'll see you next week.